So folks, you have heard about the NAR, National Association of Realtors Settlement. You have heard a lot of probably misinformation, a lot of fear out there in the real estate industry. I thought we should have a conversation with Beth Traverso, who is a top 1% agent in the country, figure out what is what, what is truth, what is fiction, what may or may not happen going forward, and uh, hopefully just calm down. Beth, how yeah. you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me here to chat about this. This has definitely been the topic of the day since it <laughs> blew up on Friday, kind of hit everybody by surprise and and left everyone kind of scrambling over the weekend trying to figure out what just happened and what does it mean? Uh, one of the first things I would say is that it's preliminary. Nothing is final yet. Department of Justice have to, has to sign off, as I understand it. Mm -hmm. We don't know if that's going to happen or if additional changes will need to be made hard to say. Um, there's been a lot of, I saw immediately some kind of sensational clickbait articles come out there. There's one in particular that was on CNN.com that got shared a tremendous amount that seemed to miss the point a lot. I think they went with what a lot of people were interested in, which was, it said something about the 6% commission is dead or something like that. As if there was we're all, as real estate agents, we're all independent business people. We're all entrepreneurs. There always has been a variety of different service levels and price options for representation out there. That's nothing new. People could always opt to go without an agent too. Like that's all, FISBO for sale by owners always been out there. Um, but this, this concept that there's this mandated 6% is absurd and in many areas, we, you know, there's a lot of agents out there that would say 6%. What are you talking about? We haven't mm -hmm. done that in a long time. Some charge that, some may charge more. That's just how it is in a marketplace where people are, are conducting their own business. Mm -hmm. um, but that wasn't even what the lawsuit was about. Really, it was more about paying the buyer's agent. Should the seller have to pay the buyer to have their Correct. representation? That was the heart of it. And Correct. then the debate is about if the, buyer's agent, how that buyer's agent compensation will be handled and how that will be negotiated. Now, one right. of the things that's interesting in Washington state, we did a video about this back in January is our state has been ahead of this and implemented a lot of these changes back in January. So okay. we already, there's already a, a sort of a separation in our listing agreement between what's paid to the listing agent, what's paid to the buyer agent. It's not one lump sum going to the listing agent. The listing agent decides how much they're going to give to the buyer agent. It's been split out and there's a process set up so it can be negotiated per transaction. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing that Washington changed that some other states have already implemented is the mandatory buyer agency agreement. I think it's one of the most impactful things that I am really looking forward to. I think it's fantastic to have buyer agency agreements with compensation negotiated up front between the yep. agent and the buyer. And then mm -hmm. that's brought to the table when that buyer buyer's agent is negotiating the contract with the, the seller through the listing agent. So mm -hmm. that's something I think is a huge benefit to, to agents in particular. It's beneficial to buyers as well, because if, years ago, uh, and I've been in this business a very long time. And I remember when I started, it, it was sometimes portrayed by some agents as, buyers agents are free. And mm. that's not true. Buyers agents aren't free. They're getting paid. But a lot of times it was very unclear how much they were getting paid. I think a lot of times buyers didn't know how much their agents were getting paid or who was paying them. And, and then there's the debate of who's paying it because the seller feels like they're paying it, but then the buyer is the one who they're either bringing their own cash or funds from a loan to purchase the property. So that's actually the source of the funds. So mm -hmm. I'm I'm throwing a lot of things at you here, so <laughs> so let's so let's yeah I I I want to level set with what we knew today, and I think you're absolutely right. It's not done until the DOJ kind of signs off on this. But let's just assume, um, let's just assume it gets signed off because if they're yeah, otherwise we really can't have a conversation. Right. So I agree with you. The suit, um, the suit was brought, in my understanding, by sellers, and hence the negotiation has been a net positive to sellers in my opinion again under the under the current rules where um you basically are you, one of the big things that i think we haven't touched on yet that i i see in the settlement is 
you no longer can put in the MLS the percent or the split or whatever, which will, because what the, what the fear was is you could steer, right? You would steer to the high commission and away from the low commission, simply said. So I think that one net change is is interesting. And really interesting too, because it takes the transparency away. So again, in our MLS, we were one of the first of uh, two, three years ago to put the the buyer agents commission on the public facing part of the website. So it's syndicated to the Redfins and the Zillows and everywhere else, making sure it was out there for everyone to see. And now they're rolling that all the way back, which will be interesting because that always has been a narrative that if you're offering nothing or close or lower percentage than others you may not get as many showings and it could be more and that could be something that could change um what it what it means now so in my mls i've seen since we we, we've had it's possible to put zero commission on the mls for some time now very few are actually doing it what i found is a lot of sellers understand the value of the buyer's agent and they want to compensate that buyer's agent Mm -hmm. they're I, I welcome the concept of having a negotiation about it on a case by case basis. And it just becomes one more term. It's negotiated as part of the, yep. the purchase and sale contract. You know, you've got inspections, you've got price, you have earnest money, closing day, all these things. And that's going to be one more thing that's going to be in there and going to need to be negotiated. Taking that out a hundred percent will be interesting because people still need to find out what's being offered so they can know how to structure their, I mean, so it's going to, that's one of the most confusing things when I think about like logistically, like I'm going to have to figure out how to implement this. How is that going to yeah. work out? I might be getting hundreds of calls every day from people that need to, you know, cause they're going to need to find out one way or the other. Mm-hmm. Um, now, another thing I, I should note is that the Northwest MLS here in the Seattle, Seattle area that covers most of Washington is not affiliated with NAR N- national oh. association of realtors. So it's unknown how this is going to impact us. I'm a member of NAR and a lot of agents are out there. I don't know if it's the majority or not, but it's not required in our area to be a part of the MLS. So our MLS issued a very short bulletin basically saying, we're trying to evaluate how this is going to impact us. I'm sure the attorneys are talking and everyone's trying to figure out what their policy is going to be. Mm -hmm. Uh, And they may implement some of these things anyway. They may remove that and... That would be interesting. I think it's going to add to a lot of confusion because there needs to be some process to find out, okay, we need a starting point for this negotiation. And are the buyers going to be starting that with their offer? How does that work with multiple offers? So another thing too, is if if buyers are coming directly to me as a listing agent, I do most primarily listings. I work with buyers too, but I were, I do, I'm primarily on the listing side. And so I'm thinking, how is this going to work? If if I have a popular listing and I have say eight buyers all coming to me that want to be represented or they don't have a rep- they don't have representation they want me to facilitate writing that offer I am representing the seller how is that going to work <laughs> these are things that we will it's going to be a little bit you know it's it's going to be sticky for a while figuring these things out it's got a lot of friction a lot mm-hmm. of friction coming uh I again when I look at kind of the big pieces sellers, I think over time, what we'll pay less commission, which means they net win, which I think was the purpose of the suit. Yeah. I think that's fair to assume. Total commission will go down. I also think it's fair to assume that if you are primarily a buyer's agent, not like yourself, who's primarily listing, your world has changed in a pretty big way. Yeah. And just because it's changed in a big way doesn't mean it's bad. No. It just means it changed. And it's really what you do with that. I think that's fair. The other thing that I think with fairly good certainty is a lot of the pretenders, the ones that don't like work, the ones that don't love real estate, they will go do something else. They're going to leave the industry. Uh, I think that's one of the best things that's going to come out of this, honestly. I really look forward to that because the agents that can show their worth and and sharpen their skills and negotiate this and work through this are going to succeed. But the people who are just the dabblers, there's, I, I've read that over, I've been told by my brokerage and uh, you know, various other mentors I work with that over 50% of the agents in our MLS sell less one or less a year. 
And that's a huge, huge number of agents who aren't doing any business. And chances are those are a lot of the ones that might be making it seem like, hey, these agents aren't doing, doing anything for me in my sale and making people feel like they weren't getting their money's worth. And if you can't bring the value, then honestly, you shouldn't be hired to do the job. One thing yeah. that is not a part of this suit that I wish somebody would do something about is make the bar of entry higher. It's yeah. way too easy to get your real estate license and a huge number of people get it. It's like almost everybody at some point in their lives either has their license or had their license. Mm-hmm. Um, the job of being a great buyer's agent is a lot more difficult and skilled than people realize. Think about how many of those agents that come in, there's, I think, a 90% attrition rate within five years. I think half yep. drop out before the first license renewal. Yep. And it's not because the job was too easy and they were making too much money. That's not why they dropped out. So <laughs> there's more to it than people realize. And sometimes if your transaction is really smooth and went off without a hitch, it's because your agent has a lot of skill and they know how to yeah. structure it right, communicate right, set the expectations yeah. get the job done, bring in the resources as needed. And that's why your transaction went smooth. So yeah. it's not necessarily if your transaction was drawn out and difficult, that that's, I mean, sometimes those are going to happen regardless, but it's oftentimes that that buyer's agent, that's the buffer with the listing yeah. agent helping make that happen. So there, there is value there for great buyer's agents and those that don't have it will uh, filter out. And I think that's overdue, honestly. So- when I, so, we, so far we agree on everything. The other thing that I think, I, I I hope this is not true, but this is a fear. I think first time home buyers, VA home buyers, are hurt the most. Yeah. Because they have the least down, the least financial backing. VA, I mean, VA loans. You're not allowed to. You don't bring anything. And now you're going to be yeah. on the hook for buyers. Com- I mean, it, it's not it just, allowed. It's a VA. It's a disallowed. Uh, it's a disallowed. Expense. Yeah, exactly. So they're not yeah. allowed to pay their agent at this point. So some of these things they're going to have to work the kinks out. May, might some of these kinks that may need to be ironed out might be some of the policies may need to change about that because it's the first time home buyers a lot of the time that need, you know, and VA buyers often too. Like they're the ones that need representation there's a reason yeah. why buyer's agency came along it didn't always exist when yeah, i got in, right. in 1998 yep. it was new and as of 1997 in washington was when they changed it to create buyer agency because everyone was working for the seller and it buyers wasn't always like a thing. they were getting exactly. the short end of the stick and they were a lot of the time because that was everybody's job was to get the best possible price yeah. and terms and everything else for the seller exactly so the reason definitely... why that came about and the and those that can afford to pay um, will pay, I think, or there will some some kind of. Well, I have an I have an I, I have an idea on that. We'll mm-hmm. get to that next. But again, I think I think entry level first time home buyer VA, they are potentially significantly impaired by what is currently positioned. Yeah, and- I think they stand to be impacted negatively the most, more than any other party in this, which yeah. is heartbreaking in a way. Yeah. Well, now let's flip the script um, to investors. And it's funny. I just came to this today. I was talking to Omar earlier, who's an agent in Southern California for the audience. And I let him know that if you are a buyer's agent, it's time for you to get a list of investors, figure out what their buy boxes are and start hunting. Because Mm -hmm. what I told him to do, I have a whiteboard here. I'm trying to prepare for a video that basically tells Vegas agents, I'm willing to pay three, I'm willing to pay as a buyer 3% commission for something in my buy box that I deem to be a great deal. Mm -hmm. And then as I'm going through this in real time and my brain's working, I'm like, I'll offer a 1% kicker for seller financing. I love it. I offer a a flat fee $1,000 bonus for an 11% yield or whatever it is, right? A buyer's agent that works with investors, you can create almost a menu of what your buyers want. And then, oh, by the way, you start hunting. Like, let's just say, for example, I wanted to buy a condo in this zip code of Vegas. Oh, by the way, there are 75 of them available today. If you know that I want seller financing as a kicker, how long would it take a buyer's agent to call 75 listing agents 
and have a conversation. Yeah. Now, a lot of buyers they just will have to skill up because you have to have the conversation and know why seller financing is good and right all the tax advantages. But you know that's on you. Learn your craft. Yeah, it would take them three days. And oh, by the way, they get the three percent. They get the seller financing kicker. I mean, there's. I think the buyers agents that actually look at this as an opportunity, oh, yeah. they can make more money because an yeah. investor like me. I don't give a rat's ass. I'll pay you 5%. If you bring me a great deal with all of these things that I want. Right. 5%. I mean, I don't care. It's I bake it into my, my calculation. Mm -hmm. It's pretty wild to think about. Yeah. And that's, that's a fantastic example of bringing the value. If an agent can uh, demonstrate, show their skill and bring the value, they're worth whatever they get paid, you know, and, and the Absolutely. more they bring, especially things that you can't just easily just scoop up just the, if you're able to find something, you know, maybe even off market or uh, something that has the seller financing or other particular terms that are going to be more advantageous to you as a buyer, yeah. of course, that's going to bring the value. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of ways for a lot of a lot of really great agents to really thrive through this. And so I would advise my advice to agents is take a deep breath, mm -hmm. maybe give yourself a day or two to mope around if that's what you're doing, but then you got to scoop yourself up and adapt and toughen up here and sharpen your skill set. Yeah. I really, I really do think, you know, as, it, as the news broke Friday and certainly got into Saturday and Sunday, it was definitely the buyer's agents who were feeling the most stress, pain, unloved. But the more and more I think about the job of a buyer's agent, it's frankly been pretty easy comparatively yeah. speaking. But now if you're a buyer's agent, go, okay, how do I document my value? Mm -hmm. Here's the reality, Beth. Over the last 24 years or so, I've done hundreds of transactions and I've always been responsible for negotiation. But if you're a buyer's agent now and you know what your buyers want, you can start negotiating ahead of time. Mm -hmm. You can bring them these things. And yeah, you're going to have to skill up. You're going to have to be different. But guess what? If you bring that value, you're going to get paid. Yeah. And that's how it's always been. The, the people that are really great at their job and are bringing the value won't have any problem negotiating this. And a lot of the people that were saying the woe is me were automatically going to, oh, buyer's agents can't get paid anymore. Nobody said that. Nobody said I that. I think the vast majority of sellers are going to be willing to pay a buyer's agent. It's, you know, I talk to sellers every single day and I haven't had any, and we've implemented a lot of these changes months ago. Right. Very little pushback about not wanting to pay the buyer agent. There may be some compression of that. We've had that for years now. There's been many, many things working to compress commissions. And I think that that will continue. And there's going to be more agents at the top doing more business. And then some of the people at the bot, the, the wide bottom that aren't doing much at all will, will mm -hmm. flush out of the system just by the, yeah. these forces. But those that are able to, uh, sit down with prospective buyers and explain to them what they do and how this is going to work and what do you do if the seller is offering this much and how we're going to negotiate it. And you're just going to have to go in there and work for it. Everyone's going to have to work harder. Mm -hmm. And here we all know about doing the work, right? So it's just about it's we agents are going to need to do the work too more than ever. It's never been an easy field, despite what the public might think. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's just a matter of just, we just have to just sharpen our tools and, and really get to work. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I want to make sure that we don't forget to mention is, uh, in these articles, there's been this overarching theme of prices are going to go down because oh, I'm so glad you brought that, that was up. the thing that made me just first laugh and then get angry when I kept seeing that prices are about to go down. It's about to cost you less to buy a house and, you know, the, the market's so high and everybody wants the prices down with the greedy real estate agents are getting there. So, you know, they're getting pushed out. So you're going to save money buying houses. And prices are going down because of not NAR. going to like, I don't know what I got to bet or how I do it, but can I bet on that? Because <laughs> me too. I, I want, talk I'm down. to sellers, as I mentioned, I talk to them literally every single every day, day, real world sellers. There's not a one of them out there that's going to want to drop their price on their house because of some perceived savings and commission. They might pocket that difference glass. Badly, who would oh no absolutely no, yeah, yeah I, so... I don't i just don't understand the logic all right we have margin compression of a percent let's just pretend mm -hmm. 
you think the seller's not going to say thank you very much? I mean, hell yeah, of course they will. I would, you know, and so they, you know, if that, if that's how it works out, of course, they're just going to take that. They're going to, but when we're talking about pricing, we look at compare comparable sales in the area, exactly. period, end of story. And, you know, I don't want to digress too much, but I remember you, I don't know if it was 10 or 15 years ago, there was a lawsuit. This reminds me of something that happened in title insurance. It mm-hmm. used to be some of the veteran agents out there will remember how they used to whine and dine us and they would, you know, yep. for the brokers open the open house, they'd bring all these platters of food and throw these lavish parties for the agents. Mm-hmm. And then a lawsuit came along saying title insurance is too expensive. We need to cut out this you know, pay, yep. money being given to the agents. And so they cut that all out. Now they can give you like a branded pen and maybe a post-it notepad with their name on it or something. And that's it. Right. And that's fine. Whatever. I never needed all that. Those cheese platters and orders and stuff, but um, guess what? You know, tri- title insurance didn't go down at all. And yeah. a part of me was wondering, like, I think it's the, I was like, I bet it's these title insurance companies that might've been behind this. Cause they just got yeah, the heat, that extra money. margins went up. Their margins went up. Great. You know, it's all fine. You know, no big deal. But yeah. the thought that they, that you can cut the expense and that that will somehow be passed on to the buyer. I know that's sort of this free market concept, but yeah, I don't see it happening here. Yeah. So let, let's kind of break this down and, and summarize again, we're going to assume for the moment that the current, um, I don't know, resolution is is accepted, right? There's no further negotiation. Uh, I do think it's fair to say uh, that there'll be less real estate agents a year from now than today. Fair? Yes. I think it's also fair to say that there will be some compression in total commission paid uh, a year from now than today. Yes. Uh, I think the, the buyer's agent job is most impacted versus a listing agent's job. Listing agent's job is not is impacted as well, but you may just be picking up more work um, mm-hmm. from the other side. So I think buyer's agents need to look themselves in the mirror and, and ask some hard questions. Is that fair? Yes. I think first-time home buyers, VA buyers are potentially significantly impaired. There will likely have to be some legislation changes mm-hmm. uh, to, to, to really make those programs even function. Uh, as they're currently written. But yeah, first time home buyers and VA buyers are hurt a lot by the yes. current resolution. Yes. They're going to, sorry, are you? Yeah, I, I got more. Okay, you go. I Keep got going. more. Yeah. Home prices will not fall because of some NAR settlement. Get it. Don't understand. That's the worst part of all of this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, the crash bros are funny. Oh, the crash bros. And then the last one is if you are an investor and you, you know, you do a couple of transactions, this could actually turn out to be a net positive for you because you can reward buyers agents to do work and pre-negotiate deals and hunt for things in the MLS. Cause that's what I've been doing. That's what I've been doing for 20 years. If I've been looking for little cracks in the system and looking for those oddball deals, now in theory, I could offer a retainer to two or three different agents to make 50 phone calls a day or whatever. And we could all win together. I mean, that that could be a big change as well. Oh yeah. I welcome all of this. And it's like you said, it's an opportunity to skill up. We agents have been disrupted many times. This is just the latest way. Um, I, I, you know, I remember, I know I, I, yes, I'm old. It's official, but you know, I'm old. It's official. When, Zillow was going to put us out of yeah. business, you know, and before, before my time, it was the internet was going to put yep. agents out of business. And then it was these I buyers that were going to put open doors and all that. It never, there's always something that's going to put us out of business. Yeah. But yet ultimately the, the, there's an, enough buyers and sellers out there that want representation. For most, this is one of the biggest transactions or the biggest asset they will ever sell or the biggest asset Mm -hmm. they will ever buy. And it's a big deal for them. And it's a lot more complicated than push button buy house or push button sell house. And there's a lot of people involved. And then people sometimes when they're under stress, when they're moving, things can flare up. They need Mm -hmm. people like great, they need great agents to come in there and smooth the path and help keep everybody on the rails and keep it all the way through to successful closing. And people Mm -hmm. need that representation, how it's going to happen and possibly how much is compensated can be 
change. You know, there's, there's going to be maybe some new platforms may come out of this. Mm -hmm. There are yeah, options that, now. There may be more new options, and that could be exciting. I think yeah, you know, rather yeah. than trying to fight what we can't fight as agents, I think the best are going to adapt and are going to yeah. pick up market share here when a lot of others are running scared. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the technology because that was kind of my my final thought. Is there's and I'd be shocked if Zillow and Redfin and these others aren't already actively doing this. And um, there will be some technology that comes out to try to be a low cost, no frills buyer yeah. side of I'm this. I'm curious this, to see that's coming. how that adapts, especially the Zillow model, you know, because they're shifting away from their premier agent model um, yep. where that was agents purchasing very, very expensive buyer leads to feed yep. their them and their teams. And then they now they're shifting to the flex model, which is where they take 40, they, they have more control over those leads and they send them, there's no upfront cost, but they send them to their specially selected and trained flex teams in each market. And they ask for a 40% referral fee off of Woo! each one of those. That's huge. So they're Damn. taking a huge amount of that buyer side commission. And if that gets compressed significantly, there's at 40% as a team leader, if you're paying 40% to Zillow and then you're paying your team members who are actually doing the work, plus yeah, all your other overhead, there's very little margin there. There's nothing it's, left. It's, it's, it's like maybe 10% if you're lucky. And if that gets sucked out, what is the point of doing any of that? So they're oh, going to have to make some, they're going to have to pivot, you know, and, and, and also how it's going to work. If you have to sign a buyer agency agreement before you can show a house, Ooh, when, when yep. I was working with Zillow buyers a lot, I built my business on Zillow. So much, I got a lot of respect for Zillow. They um they did really great by me for a long time. So um what I what I found was those buyers don't know who they're contacting. They're pushing a button to talk yeah. to someone to open the door, and they don't necessarily want to marry that person, so to speak. Yep. They just want to get in the door. Yep. And so now they're going to need to sign a. a commitment of some sort it might be just specific to that one property or who knows what but something is going to need to be signed as far as a legal yeah. document and that might be another barrier yeah so it's, we'll see yeah. you know, i heard redfin is working out there bringing a little bit of their buyer rebate back a little bit so if you hmm. sign their agreement you have to commit to them um but you get a little it's not nearly what it was in the beginning a lot of these big um platforms have realized that the rebate system doesn't really work because overhead's a lot higher than people realize. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. there's going to be a lot of shakeup and I'll be watching all of that, but some of there, I can guarantee you, they're already trying to figure out ways to come out on top. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm sure many will find there's that's the beauty of this business is there's any, it's like a smorgasbord of all these different ways you can do it. And there's going to be people that are going to be high touch concierge service. There's going to be people who are out, finding the deals and bringing yep. the value by um, serving you these wonderful deals on a platter and they get paid more for that as they should. Yep. And Absolutely. Then I will gladly pay the bargain them. basement where like, don't ever call me, you know, if you want something, never call me. But if you fill out this form online, I'll put it into the contract and, you know, hopefully it all goes well for you. Godspeed. You know, there's going to be those too, you know, so. Yep. Yeah. I think I what's, what's going to happen good. is, is, Certainly on the buyer side, you're going to have the no frills, bottom of the barrel, and then there will be the kind of concierge, high touch, high service, mm -hmm. high value, high paid. Mm -hmm. and there'll be like very little in the middle. Yeah. And if, if buyers are going to be trying to go it alone, I know some are capable of doing that. And some will say, inevitably say, yeah, I did it. It was great. I'm so glad. For a lot of people, they don't really know what they don't know. And going into it unprepared, especially when we're dealing with people that are under a lot of stress. Yeah. If there's nobody guiding you, it might be hard to know how to analyze an inspection report. What condition, mm -hmm. what, what contract terms should you include in your offer? What's customary and what's not depending on what yeah. makes sense for this listing versus another, you know, if it's very competitive, it's going to be one way of writing your offer. If it's been on the market a hundred days, it's going to be something different. Yeah. You need somebody to coach you through that. And then when, when you're panicking in the middle of the night on a Saturday, you know, who's going to talk you off the ledge? Yeah. There's a lot that buyer's agents do that yeah. a lot of people don't really have much concept of that. But um, you know, one thing I'm sure of is that it will be a little sticky and bumpy, but we will work through this. It will shift. It will stir things up. Not the first time or the last. Mm -hmm. 
those that bring the value will continue to be well compensated for the work they do. Yeah. And how, it, it, how it, it happens is going to be a little different. And that's, I welcome it. It's a change that is overdue. Yeah. I think at the end of the day, it, it is fair to say that the home buying and selling process is fundamentally different now than it was Thursday, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, given what's going on with NAR. And different doesn't mean bad, just different means no. different. And uh, yep, if somebody wanted to buy or sell up in King County or get a referral to other amazing agents, how would they reach out? I can be found at BethTraversoGroup.com. Or if you're part of the One Rental at a Time Facebook group, you can find me on there real easily too. So. Very cool, there. Beth. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you.